L. Ron Howard wanted to start a cult. L. Ron Hubbard. That's 100% L. Ron Howard. It's 100% L. Ron Hubbard. It's 100% L. Ron Howard. 100%. Nick, what you gotta do is break him down. You gotta L. Ron Howard him. That's not a thing. So much about Scientology except the guy's name. That's the easiest part of it. What was it did with the invent Scientology like after he directed Backdraft in Apollo 13? No, that was Ron Howard. I'm talking about L. Ron Howard. Oh my God. Guys, so can we please stop? <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's always funny to me. Uh, well, Good it's morning, funny to everyone. everybody that watches there, Daddy O. <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed you found that bad boy. Oh, my God. I watch that show all the time. Uh, and then actually watching it, is, it again. It's okay. a really good show. It only lasted two seasons, and I don't know why. It's such a good show. Um, but, anyways, hey, good morning. Good, uh, happy Sunday morning and happy uh, Monday evening. And in some cases, happy Monday morning. Um, this one's a long time coming. I have been wanting to get Jackson on here forever, and it's not his fault. It's my fault for not scheduling well, it. No, but, it's um, been both of our conflicting schedules, let's be honest. Yeah, it's a not... little bit, but mostly me, mostly me. <laughs> and I'm going to uh, quickly just, just um, you know, as I always do with my guests, kind of maybe embarrass him a little bit because, guys, Jackson has, has been a friend of mine for a very long time. And, you know, we walk out of a cult with – Lots of different experiences, good or bad. But my experience with Jackson well and the Colt was always positive. And I'll explain a little bit of that later. Yeah, it was but always 100% solid. The way it really it. was. And, you know, for a guy in a position where he could ultimately torture everyone he wanted to freely, he did choose not to do so. Uh, he chose to be gracious, kind, have a big heart, and at least put a little bit of excitement into our <laughs> otherwise boring lives with his Saturday morning drills with the way he taught me specifically how to deal with emergency situations how to stay calm when someone's injured the many many things that i've actually still used to this day and i'm always gracious he taught me wow. that besides that guys he's also a dodgers fan which is which is a which is a bonus hell to the, the yeah baby and i'm gonna pull something up here guys just in case True anyone blue all the way through did not there hear the is. news there it is <laughs> Donnie is a Dodger. Matt Elliott at SPT MAA Canada. Uh, Otani is a Dodger. So it uh, looks wow, like you guys yeah, are going to have right. to come south to see the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, I am super excited about for that. For any uh, true true ball ball player fans out there, that you, you all know what it's like when you get a good solid player added to the to the roster and what it means for the upcoming season. So we'll see. It only plays out. You know, money. Money's one thing, talent is the other. So that's I right. It, I, I actually have maintains. relatives that are Rockies fans, and they texted me last night, uh, <laughs> complaining, and then said, "If we don't change our pitching, we've got no chance, anyways." Oh, yeah, but, whatever. But, but I said, "Hey, as long as you're annoyed by the fact that we got Otani, <laughs> <laughs> we won. All yeah. we got to do is finish ahead of the Padres and not get beat by Arizona, and we're yeah. good. And then Houston has to lose, and uh, we're well. Sad. You know, there's a lot of challenges. Everybody's roster is a challenge, one way or the other. So. So true. It's the whole point um, of it being a game. Yeah, guys, when I first left, Jackson and I used to go to Dodger games together when he yeah. lived down in L.A. Uh, no, ma! Yeah. We and we would sit in the outfield, left field pavilion, and yeah. I would try to catch fly balls during batting practice. Yeah. Um, and Well, we all know, did, but... yeah. You, it, I, we, I love those moments where we could yell, no, Mar Gar yeah. Garcia Parra, <laughs> and we could hear it echo back to us. And uh, we knew we were getting some airtime the background uh, ambient game sounds. You can yes. hear us two idiots out there going, no, ma! <laughs> we would lose our voices yelling and insults at the opposing team's left fielder. Yeah, no, that was those were good yeah, times. Yeah, I remember we sat out there when Barry Bonds would be out there in right field. Remember that? Wasn't yep, that cool? Yep, he stand yep. there right, I mean, whatever. He's just another human being, but the amount of taunting that used to be thrown at him while he's standing out there playing ball it was, was uh, pretty impressive what he would take. But anyways... Oh. Brutal, brutal, yeah. but impressive. Brutal, but impressive. Yeah, we had um, we had a good time, man. That was our our uh, God. That was gosh, what back in uh, two thousand five? Yeah, two thousand five, two thousand six. I think two thousand six was our last time. The summer of two thousand six, yep. our Thursday night games. We used to love that midweek. Yep. yep. How cool and nice, and you know, it was so great getting out there. Yeah, I lived in Glendale, so I remember you we, you would yeah, come by and we'd, we'd carpool to the stadium because it was only yeah. what, like fifteen minutes away yeah. from me. Yep. Yeah. I miss it. I miss oh, it. I miss it. It we is need to move Dodger, Dodger Stadium to Oregon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it Chavez get, Ravine up here in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, right. It can get pretty crowded there now. Oh. I went to the All Star Game last year, uh, and it was it was just like it was so packed in there and tight. It wasn't super 
comfortable also honestly that you know the the I didn't like there was a couple people on the all star team that were batting 260, 280, and I was like, How are they on the yeah. all star team? <laughs> but I did you get know, to see it, Tony. My sweet um, little secret about baseball is I don't even know what the batting average, I don't even know how to uh, conclude that percentage rate. It's always confused me, even when I played Little League. It's like <laughs> you bat 230. I mean, I like just out of the five times I was up, did I get five hits? Uh, yeah, or did I not get five hits? You know, so, <laughs> my dad taught me as a kid all about how to figure out the batting averages which yeah. I was well I know it's simple I just for some yeah. reason my brain chooses not to uh <laughs> accept understanding of such simple it's just how far <laughs> you hit the ball <laughs> how far you crushed yeah, it yeah yeah whether it makes it through the infield and I'm standing on a pad that's right <laughs> <laughs> yeah I even remember playing softball with you up in Glendale one time hell, hell yeah man that yeah. was uh that was a that was a fun time I mean I played that got almost from within the first month that I well when I arrived in LA, I, w- I joined a softball team, not realizing what I was getting into, but joined the Glendale Softball League and played that every weekend, every Saturday for seven, eight years till I moved up here. Yeah, no, it's fun. I mean, if you were down here, man, I would you would be on my Malibu team in a second, in a second. <laughs> well, I'd love it. I I I, uh, I miss the old unlimited arc under a slow pitch softball. Yeah. <laughs> the outfielders would back up so far when you came up that I would try to bat after you. That way they stayed out there and I would get all my singles just dropping right in front of them. Uh, guess, guess where anyway. D Marinis are made. Oh, some of the bats now are so loaded, but um, guess where they're made. Where? No, Here Portland, Hillsborough, Hillsborough, Oregon. Yeah. Oh, you got to go up there. You got to go up there on a day when they're when they're getting rid of ones with slight defects. And old get se- yeah, old season to new. Dig yeah. around the dumpster. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> but anyways, I was thinking. So well, you, we've been winding. Look to at talk that Wonder about. Woman's in here. What a fabulous name! Oh, she's awesome. Wow. Yeah, she's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, just, I was just, trying to think, should you tell a little bit of your story? But I kind of think, you know, it would be presumptuous of me to even think that most people don't know your story. Um, but if you did want to put it together real quickly, you know, like in a minute, just say what you, uh, where you were, where you came from. Well, and then we can get right into it just in case there are some new people. We are going to have a lot of Reese's pieces in here and they may not have had a chance to see you yet. So if you well, want to do that quickly. moment of silence, so we can hear the little foot stomping in and send the final step up onto the <laughs> Apple box. <laughs> He's joined us today. Oh gosh, someone. <laughs> so see, there's people who know about my story because there's some reference to Barrett Oliver. So, um, yeah, you're you're uh, the listening crowd here knows a little bit about my background. Um, well, let's just say I got to the base years before Sterling did. I I'm not even sure if you were a thought in your dad's tidy whities but um, seventy six. I was born in seventy six. Oh, okay, yeah. So I was already at the base. I I arrived at the base in eighty two. Sterling and I aren't too far apart, but um, there. Uh, in terms of being at the Ant Base, uh, I got there in '82, and you, you, uh, you showed up at the Ant Ranch. What in the late '80s, early '90s? I want to say neither '90 or '91 is okay, my guess. So, yeah. so shortly at about about around. Well, I mean, if you got involved in the drilling, so that would have been after '90, 90, 1990. So. Yeah, I think it was Somewhere. 94, 95, 96, I was in drill. Uh, I would do the drills with you guys. I actually have a picture oh. of um, me and some of the SEMO Gold crew uh, doing our hose drills. You actually have a white picture boxes. of that? What? Yeah. You actually have a picture? I do. I do. Wow. You, do you have it for today's entertainment? Uh, I can look for it. I can well, look for it. Don't, well, you're telling a little part of the story if you want. Well, No, we'll, we'll do it some other time. But um, yeah. uh, holy smokes there, Sterling. Yeah, wow. I mean it's it's just it's just myself, um, uh, Roanne, uh, and one and Sabron Walker and oh, wow. um, uh, the cute little French lady. I forgot her name, but anyways, yeah. Just uh, you can see, I'm holding I'm holding one rolled up hose, and we're running out to throw them out and roll them out for our drills. Yeah, yeah. I'm wearing yeah. my Jordans, uh, but yeah, that was clearly that was a day when you got you were running drills and we were doing our thing. So it was pretty awesome. Yeah, that was a moment in my life yeah. in the Sea Org. I got to say. Um, yeah. Well, I arrived at the base in 82. I was just a young little punk, 15, 16 years old, and um, started off in the cinematography division. First work in sets and props. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't. But uh, when I started in sets and props, it was um, Jim Pettigrew, Dave Long, um, Kevin McGowey, and uh, uh, Gabe Olagi. 
and uh, and me. And um, I kind of arrived at the same time Battlefield Earth was being promoted. Uh, Norman Starkey was part of uh, ASI, Author Services, Inc., Incorporated, promoting L. Ron Hubbard's written, written works. And um, there was this festival that was being put on. It was a modern day at the time called the Us Festival, which was the newest, latest, greatest attempt of reliving Woodstock, but with modern day artists. And uh, just from that event, I got to see Stevie Nicks. Uh, the Clash was there. U2 was there. That was early on in their career. Uh, Tom Petty. All the big names at that time. Pat Benatar. Anyways, you could Google it, see who was on the uh, thing. But I, <laughs> I, uh, I didn't get to see the entire show. But nonetheless, uh, I was there for the entirety of that event. And then um, shortly after that, that whole fiasco, because there is a whole story to be told simply around that event and the days leading up to it and the days following it. Um, kind of a historical little event in Imp Base, C Organization, and ASI history. Anyways. Um, Which I know nothing about, to be honest. Yeah, I've well, never heard of that about that before. But again, yeah. again, well, I was, was just a baby at that time. That right? was the was... first time I got to see Fleur. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Fleur got to run around in a bikini, and you know what that means. <laughs> yeah, that was a young, young, uh, young, young kid running around seeing that at the end base was a was a well, definitely. And it, Fleur was the one that flew me uh, the first time I flew to LA to see my parents from Florida. She was the one that actually flew me. Oh my gosh! Uh, took me as as Anyways. I must have been what seven or eight years old. So we we divert. Um, yeah, <laughs> something Sterling and I share was the uh, uh, the eye candy that we got to enjoy that we ran around. But anyways, um. So I, uh, uh, end of 82, fall, winter of 82, I, security was being developed. It was being seriously established in the Sea organization officially, uh, which I became quickly part of. I was part of the initial imp, imp base security force. Well, I can't honestly say that because Matt Pesh, Kenny Siebold, Jim Cup were the original guards wearing uniforms, but in terms of a security force and the idea of security being established and a uh, an arm of the church to be used for the sole purpose of having a security representation to the outward facing image of the imp base. I was part of that. So, um, do you know why you were selected, Jackson? Out of curiosity, I, I do because my dad was a retired police officer, and that okay. was drawn from my life history, and uh, you know. The apple falling from the tree means I get to also get involved in law enforcement. You whatever. also weren't a very small statured person. At, at that the, time at I was. Time. I was a just, you know, I was like you. I was just a skinny, tan kid. Well, there's no way. <laughs> you must yeah. have been at least six foot. <laughs> at least. I, I don't know. You know, I don't think so because okay. I think I hit that stride later, later on. I just remember having, when we officially got brand new uniforms, which you may remember in the C organization trunks and everything, everybody, all the staff. Oh, right got all their blues and whites and all that. Well, with that was we got brand new security uniforms, the the, the khaki yes. and the official new patches, which you see nowadays with an official badge and Sam Brown belt and boots. Which I'll um, never forget. I mean, it's always yeah. an image. You yeah, guys were so, always in khakis. Yeah, and um, uh, we had officially a jacket. A jacket provided us so we could stay warm during nights and winters. That was, that was a just that little thing, just that little gesture by the sea org of affording his jackets to stay warm was uh, something completely new um <laughs> well who was someone manning security when you got in there yeah you know, i it, ran it, programs a lot so I'm yeah wondering. it was it was managed by kenny okay. and um kenny and matt until matt 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 wasn't in security while i was there for a long time because he was part of the original rtc conditions order one Right. Um, that community of evidence that was being held against Dave, uh, Dave Mayo and all these other uh, technically uh, advanced staff at the base being mm -hmm. held accountable for some sort of something, getting in trouble for something they weren't in trouble for and changing their life. And um, the staff uh, were set up to be on a rotation, rotating basis that on Tuesdays at midnight, Joe would hold this watch position and he'd do that once a week or however. We would just rotate 
through C organizational standards of establishing this watch quarter stationville, um, where you as a C org member always were at the mercy of anybody's decision to establish this duties as otherwise required fulfillment right. that you find in today's working world. Well, duties as otherwise required um, could be the need to have a number of staff on hand at a given established time or an emergency. And uh, in this case, it was a security watch that these staff would hold watch and stand at a gate or patrol the property and carry these cheap, um, uh, uh, what, what do you call them? Um, Baton, walkie, yeah, they're, they're cheap, cheap walkie talkies, CB okay. radio, handheld CB radios, you know, six foot antenna, big old block of plastic with yeah. a ton of batteries in it. And some would patrol around on a Schwinn bike or just sit at a fixed position and just be eyes and ears for anybody wandering into the property. So that was a very crude version of it. N no particular training went into it for them. Just the, uh, you know, if you see something, say something. Right. Um, there right. wasn't a lot of external attention put on it, but it was established simply because of the initial theft that occurred down at the uh, the Greenskeeper's house, the GK. Um, Were you... If you don't mind me asking, were you, when you entered the security force, Jackson, was who was the security chief? Was that Kenny, Kenny Siebel? Siebel? Yeah, okay. Kenny Siebel was had always been the security chief up until 1990. Right, and Kenny Siebel, when I arrived to Golden Era Productions after the ranch, uh, he was he was the sports field IC. Yeah, um, and definitely. he also would come out and teach sports sometimes at, at the yeah. ranch. Can I ask you? Did you have a good relationship with Kenny Siebel? Yeah, was he your... was my best bud. I mean, we got along great. Uh, you know, uh, he and I got along fantastic. He, I just considered him another brother with a different mother. Because, um, you know, I had a very close relationship with Kenny Siebel as well. We were we were key to life LOC twins, and he was always yeah. one of my favorite people. Yeah, on really the good, genuine guy. Uh, yeah. Always cut, cut, you know, good looking guy. Wouldn't mind a little whipped cream with that hot chocolate. You know, he was... He was uh, into physical fitness. Um, he just looked like a man's man, had a demeanor about him that was really calm. calm he was Midwest, cool. right? He was from yeah, Ohio. Yeah, from Ohio. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he also he also was just a nice person. He was I just know. another one of those people. That, and actually very funny if you got to know him. Yeah, and very rare very would you funny. see him ever, ever yeah. get upset. Um, but he I mean, did. I know he's there and, 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 you know, we've seen him on some of the shoot crews when people have gone yeah. up to protest, which is unfortunate because there's another person that I would love to see leave. Um, well, I would have loved to see him leave years ago, but yeah, yeah. He's also in what I call the, uh, the ant base yearbook. Um, you have a yearbook. I call the ant base yearbook this. Oh, oh my God. You have that. Yeah. Is that the newest one? No, no, no. This is the one from our, this is our yearbook, buddy. This is the wait. First, so I'm in that one. Then. First edition, the year in which we all were used as uh still photographs, but yeah, he and Becky remember the, the, I think he's in the back or in the very front, but uh, pull that up, pull that up. And guys, yeah. uh, while, while Jackson's pulling that up, um, Jackson, I've been looking for that. You have to, there's a picture of me in there falling asleep as a student. Yeah. I think you were wearing like a sweater. Yeah, I was wearing a horrible color. sweater. Um, everyone in the chat, thank you for, for tuning in here. I really appreciate it. And we are going to definitely do some Q&A at the end here. Um, but yes, well, I really appreciate everyone in there. And we're definitely going to do baseball talk too. Let's see. There is my brother, Kenny. Uh, is Kenneth, this when he's uh, Jesus or? Kenneth Siebold. Yep, that would be him that's right there. Him and, yep. I Anyways, forget who the lady that's is. That's just a dude. That's Becky Morton, remember? Ah, uh, yes. She Clark was another, wife. She was yes. another cutie. Oh my God! <laughs> People, you know, I don't say all this because I'm perving out on them. It just uh, there was, there was definitely girls that ran around that were um, definitely easy on the eyes. Yeah, yeah. That was, um, so yeah, that was Kenny Siebold. He was in security and um, uh, had always been. And yeah. uh, initially, it was um, there was a lot of direction and hands-on effort by church. The church attorneys came and spent a lot of time with us informing us and drilling us about the do to do's and not do's strangely enough there was never any legal direction on um on uh, what's right from what's wrong in terms of representing the church we knew the only thing we were directed to legally was to not touch anybody and if they touched us they uh, were up for a battery. And you may have heard, I don't know, it depends on how much our 
listening public have watched other videos, but there was this recent video of uh, between Aaron and um, this gentleman that that follows the LEPD and then ran so across. I was about to mention that, Jackson. Yeah. And, Go ahead. Go in ahead. it, in it, he um, he discovered that uh, it was a double standard by the church that they could touch you, but you can't touch them without uh, serious repercussions. And it was just kind of this uh, natural exposure of this long ago established idea in the security guards minds that um, you are the aggressor. If they touch you, you aggressively go after them in terms of enforcing the legal law. Whereas if, if uh, you touch them, it was instantly stated as being an innocent occurrence and downplaying what they were taken advantage of which was simply the battery factor and they would they you know you battered them where they battered you um you know i i strongly remember it because my first time was with bent corden um who is a current ex fellow fellow ex member of ours but um he was a long ago original um outspoken critic that would show up at my gates and uh protest and you know stand to have a voice be heard but he showed up and i was holding my hand in front of a camera he was trying to take pictures right and my cam my hand bumped his camera that then bumped his eye he um called the police the sheriff's out there had me arrested citizens arrest for assault and then i i did the same thing to him and we both got arrested and, <laughs> and i was sitting in the back of a riverside county sheriff's car handcuffed just outside the old main booth looking in and Marty Rathbun's in there with Kenny and other guards and seeing them digging their pockets, trying to come up with bail money to get me out of jail. But wow. um, anyways, that was my early on occurrences with security. And what? I remained in security from the late 82, early 83 up until 1996 when I was forced off of your position uh, forced what? off of security chief by Dave Miscavige himself. So, I want to ask you about about that particular incident with the um, Scientology audits guy, because I don't know if you probably saw most of the video with him and Aaron. One thing he mentioned, which was fascinating, was that he didn't really have uh, a desire to yeah. continue to harass or, or audit Scientology. But one of the security guards had come out on one of his first um, protests or audits and um, – had called him a really bad name and made it made it yeah. a pretty digging insult, and then that got him going. Right. And he said in the video yesterday that they even tried to say, "If that guy apologizes, will you leave us alone?" And he said, "No, right. we're already at that point," which I find fascinating, and I wanted to ask you about that. Um, you know, uh, levying an insult towards someone that's protesting, I, I can't imagine that's something that you guys were told to do at any point, or that you would have done necessarily. Uh, what's your What's your opinion on that? Well. Um... I would have acted on the best interests of the church. So yeah, I would have done the same thing and had the, the exact same uh, numbed, what I call the numbed out attitude. Uh, the stuff being told to me, uh, you know, all I'd hear is la, 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 la on the, whatever they spew out Scientology. OT3 right. But stuff would you have advanced. insulted him? Would you have made it personal? Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't have gone so far, far as being as bold as what came out of that one guy's mouth. Yeah. Because I, I knew... What it, whatever I'm saying, I had this live filter in my mind of, of can say, shouldn't say, won't say certain things. And right, um, no, I was, I was not there to be treat them as though they're peasants, you know, type of spit down on, look down on. It's just I was right. I I learned early on the way I was taught was just to be a neutral. I'm just a security guard that pushes a button which opens and closes a gate. And I don't have any knowledge. Surprisingly, you'd think I would, but I don't. And right, right. Uh, that type of attitude, camera stuck in your face. Um, and just people, you know, at that time period, the aggression was not a physical one. It was more out there just verbally exercising what they wanted to verbally exercise. And that was right. pretty much it. And then keeping the staff inside and keeping them out of contact with any, any base staff member. Um, whatsoever, which is, which yeah. is the lockdown, which is, I mean, yeah. when we were there, if there was a protester or yeah. someone on the grounds or even the highway, we were made to stay inside the buildings. Yeah. That was, a, that clear. was a policy and drill long ago established before you got there back in the eighties. 
Okay. That it was our job to go around and notify the staff, get them inside, and that's what we monitored. In case uh, uh, a staff member was not informed, they find themselves wandering, you know, doing their job, going between buildings or outside doing gardening. It was our job to see to it that there was no visibility, no availability, whether by visual contact or verbal contact to our staff. And right when, when I got there, they, you guys already fortified the property too. I mean, it was yeah. You had you had fences everywhere. You had the fence yeah. shakers. You had the lights. I I believe b- before ninety three, it was a little different, or even maybe nineties when the renovations happened. I don't remember because I was at the yeah. in ranch, Golden Impressions Ranch. But I believe that there was some open gates previously. When I got there, the place was locked down. Yeah, um, it, before you got there, there wasn't as much as a of a perimeter fence established that you had come to know as where and where it was and how big the actual perimeter was fenced mm-hmm. perimeter it wasn't as big as it was it used to uh, i don't know if you remember it just being out back of mci by the dike that used to be back there mm-hmm. um and it was just on the back side of that um and that was as close as the fence ever got to any of the buildings per se oh, really? um, okay. when the property was fully designed um, and developed into what it is today, uh, the fence, the, the perimeter fence, I, you know, I was part of the crew that had to figure out where it was going to go and where it was going to be and why it was going to be because a foot out or a foot in was a five, 10 foot addition or subtraction from the total chain link fence required to install. So we had to figure all that out, how much chain link was needed, how many vertical pipes, how many holes needed to be dug the whole nine yards. So Right, right. Um, and then, of course, all the electronics, the wiring that that we installed with the fencing from uh, the underground microphones to the fence shakers, the infrared sensors, and the lighting and the cameras. So yeah. um, initially, we didn't even have cameras. Um, uh, the initial build out of the system uh, did not. We had no cameras. Really? Yeah. Yeah, um, that's hard to keep track of a property like that. Without yeah, cameras. It, it, with exception to there was cameras at the gates. So mm-hmm. as people rolled up, you can see who was there. And that was pretty much it. Um, and uh, the real uh, expansion of the cameras came about from the drive-by shooting that we had, if, if you remember that. I happened. don't. Was that was that when I was there? And before, just before you uh, continue, Jackson, I just want to make sure everyone... Um, just because we are talking about a pretty expansive and large property and just so you get an idea if you guys go to mike brown 101 he did a video a couple weeks back where he has a bunch of detailed pictures showing this entire property and the security system that's put in there and just so you guys can get an idea of what jackson's talking about and the expanse of a property that he was the security chief for and he had to maintain and keep secure it is an unbelievably large property at the same time as a, as a young kid, when I first arrived there, it was basically Disneyland too, Jackson, right? I mean, it, yeah, was, yeah. it yeah. was like softball field, volleyball yeah. courts. And, and the sickening part is later on, we didn't really get to use any of that stuff. I right know, like that much, like but not- it was, <laughs> it, at, at that point in my life, I had never been on a nicer piece of property. Yeah, no, ever. and it, yeah. it truly was beautiful. out. There was a lot of beautification done and the landscaping, everything. There, there was a, a, a professional approach of building that property to be nice, Yes. to give us an environment that was distraction free and officer offered us, uh, internal. Now, you know, there may have been, I, I come to realize later that, um, on the approval line above me, there may have been, uh, modifications or demands placed on the design of the property simply to create that image. And then also to, um, keep the security profile. So as to create this subliminal message to the staff that there is no security threat or concern. The idea is to create a safe, distraction-free environment, um, which was part of the messaging of the build-out of the property to have a distraction-free environment. That was my ultimate goal. That was always ringing in my head that my goal is to have a distraction-free environment for the staff so they can get on with their duties and their job of clearing the planet. So um, clearing the planet is, uh, for new listening ears, is Scientology's ultimate goal of getting their spiritual um it uh getting everybody of planet earth spiritually advanced to having a clear mind of anything reactive and being a, a mental state of clear to you don't have any negative 
negativism about you, you would never end up cussing somebody out or being upset at somebody or having any past memories of upset traumas. So which that they've was proven. Yeah. Which they've proven they couldn't clear a zip code at this point. Um, <laughs> they couldn't yeah. clear a drain. Um, <laughs> well, and just so we're clear, I mean, and, and, and I, I like how you put that Jackson. I thought that was very well put. It was an environment set up to make you feel comfortable and, and you had a safe environment and you had, it, I mean, it was a stunning property. It really was. But it was used as a device. Yeah. To take over away time, it, over time it was transitioned to realize yeah. the advantages of having set up such an environment. Actually, the more, <laughs> uh, what am I trying to say? The, 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 the more the, um, the livestock got <laughs> upset. Uh, the more we realized actually that we didn't have any concerns that people would just hop the fence because if they did, they couldn't do it in droves. It took a lot of homework by people yeah. who chose to leave to go figure out the weaknesses and yeah. uh, find the loopholes and get, get through them that eventually over time, what those loopholes were sewn up and um, it basically transitioned into the ideas, the, the idea of using it to keep bad people out and people from coming in and stealing stuff was a lost thought. Lost it thought. became and into using it to monitor and any alarms. The concern was if it's somebody was trying to leave. Right. right. And what so, I want to say is that also you had this beautiful property that, that again, made you feel safe and comfortable. It eventually it was used as a tool to take things away from the staff to yeah. punish them because th there was periods of years where we would walk from our building, which we worked in a hundred yards to where we ate every day. We could see the lake. We could see the park yeah. horse. We could see the soccer fields, but we could not use them. In fact, them. in some cases, the only way to get out to even see the grounds was to get removed from your position and put on heavy uh, manual labor. Then you right. get to go out there, but pull, we wouldn't even use the series where we didn't use anything for three or four years, but they just sat there perfectly maintained. They're not used to this day, Sterling. I guarantee yeah. you it's, it's a, uh, you know, from the, the, the really cool basketball courts, mm -hmm. the tennis courts, there was this exercise path called parkour, yep. which was an exercise course a mile long by design. Um, you, you would probably find them in some um, civil park parks nowadays out in a city where they have these different stations that you would run to and then do these short cardio or muscular workouts while you're running. And that's called a parkour. Um, that was a really cool thing that, that, that at the time, during the times the staff actually got to use it. A lot of people took advantage of that. Um, and you could rollerblade out there. It was all asphalted. The entire pass was, path was asphalted. People who had bikes would go do biking. But mostly, a um, uh, majority of the staff were out there on foot just enjoying it. And um, some would play basketball. And then over the course of time, they'd build little teams and start getting into little scrimmages. Um, but it was very short lived. Um, very, very short lived. Any, it, it, it only really surfaced on the ability to use it is when uh, communication came from the executives above to reinstitute life's basics of getting on a schedule in which we can get sleep, actually go study L. Ron Hubbard materials, and get some exercise. And um, we're, so exercise time was built into the schedule. And, uh, so we, you know, there was a upwards to almost 900 people there when I left. So you had to schedule the use of those facilities, uh, offset one, uh, one division, one organization from the other. So, uh, you didn't have 900 people trying to use a basketball court basically. Right. So, um, but everybody, there was time frames in which the management crew would be, would go out there and then they'd be out there for half an hour and they'd, they'd shower and go to lunch and then go to work. And the, the gold crew would go out there and they, we did ours at night mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it was like an end of the day, which was the best. Yeah. Right which away. was the best yeah. because it was the cooler part of the day rather than trying to do it out in the summertime. And we could miss, we could miss the 11 o'clock bus to keep playing basketball yeah. and take the 12 o'clock home. So we and actually got more exercise. Yeah. So you yeah. can get more exercise and that, you know, that was a little bit of more freedom of choice atmosphere that was going on at the time when those times were in. Because I think there was truly people who enjoyed the fact that the staff enjoyed the use of those facilities and saw the morale boost that it instilled in the staff. Right. And uh, anybody in their right mind, their good hearted mind would see that that's something that should have always been kept at play and maintained to keep the morale of the staff up. But no, no. Um, certainly a far fetched thought of 
uh, up the morale, uh, high morale staff was, uh, there was no empathy, no concern towards it. So anyways, yeah. back to my story. Um, I was in security up in the 96. I actually became officially the security chief in 1990 when the big flood happened because Kenny Siebold really pissed Dave Miscavige off. And um, he was taken, Kenny had had these um, occurrences, which I didn't know specifically what they specifically were, but during the course in Kenny's involvement of security up until 1990, he uh, managed to do a few things randomly to end up pissing Dave off. (laughs) <laughs> and Dave was always in disfavor of him, but this was the final straw. Yeah. And it was specifically stated that Kenny Siebel was never to ever be in security ever again. And that kind of took the last breath of fresh air out of Kenny's lungs of doing what he loved. So he transitioned that desire of his towards his interest because he always worked out. He always kept himself butt, buff and cut. Um, uh, you know, just a very physic, uh, physically good looking guy, w- well in shape. So, um, and, you know, and it was because of him that our security force would get the weight workout programs because Kenny kind of run them and he, he was always good. No matter, it didn't seem to bother him, whatever was going on, he'd always find time to go lift weight. So, right. um, he carried he did, that on. Part of his job was to maintain that weight center too. When he became the sports yeah, field and uh, he you know, because of the new facilities built, you had to establish people who were in charge of them to take care of them and manage them while they were being used. And we had this new exercise building that was once the uh, the grounds building where all the grounds equipment for maintaining a golf course were kept back in the original day of that property, and it just became this dilapidated uh, facility that. Um, was torn down and then the exercise building was built and believe it or not, the walls to the exercise building, those cinder blocks are the original cinder blocks, um, to the, uh, the ground shed from back in the day, the Gilman hot springs was ever built. So really, yeah, that, that was one thing they didn't tear down cause, uh, they wanted a nice sturdy sound proof building to work out in. And I got to tell you, it was a beautiful facility. Oh my um, goodness. Yeah. It was a, um, I mean, the entire of the four walls in there, three of them were completely lined with full size mirrors. So, you, you know, it's part of when working out, watching how your body reacts to it and just kind of expanded a, the space. But the, the weight equipment was um, the same that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, used. It was called Icarian. Uh, uh, it, it was, the brand name was Icarian, but. I just remember how exclusive it was that we obviously spent a lot of money getting this and it was all very professional. It was no rinky dinky. We didn't order it through Sears or Amazon or something, which didn't exist at the time, but you know, it was no mail order equipment. This stuff was custom made for us and it it eventually became the standard equipment that you would find through any other C organization base, either whether it was on free ones or in Florida, wherever Dave had them established, uh, that equipment was, and most likely is still there to this day. But um, the, we had a big, what, inch and a half thick rubber floor, Matting hard rubbers. Area. So, um, you know, uh, it was it had a great sound system. It had an audio-visual system in it, but I loved the sound system. You could just crank up the stereo in there yeah, and uh, yeah. listen to some hardcore music. But, again, Dave, Dave did not make that. It was intended to be for the staff, but Dave issued orders that it was only for his and his use only. And then Shelly is the one that got the security guards authorized because I talked to her about it once. And she asked if we worked down to it. She was surprised to hear that we hadn't. She felt that uh, obviously security force doesn't, you, you know, you don't want a security force that is weak and unable to uh, defend our staff. So she, we were the only ones authorized to routinely use that. So we'd go down there after Dave and my guards would use it. Not to say they ended up being any uh, world weightlifting champions, but... um well, not we Chris the, Leak, not Chris Leak, at least. Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> little Chris Leak. My <laughs> gosh, fun little kid. Anyway, so, um, yeah, uh, I don't know if I, I fully answered the question, but that's well, pretty kinda, much. Yeah, huh? you know, you did, you did, you answered okay. the question. I mean, we're, we're up to the point where, you know, we, we were talking about Kenny Siebold and you, you'd taken his place. And that kind of makes me want to jump into um, 
you know, part of the message is, is we have these facilities and I, I'm watching the chat a little bit and I'm seeing we're going to get to that because you're right. It, it is it is cultish behavior to have all these facilities, but take them away from the people so they can't exercise so they can, yeah. you know, uh, be happy. And, and it would have made a big difference to a lot of people there to get regular exercise, be happy and do that stuff. And it just, it just wasn't provided or it was taken away eventually. I mean, even the weight room, Jackson, as you said, yeah. with Dave Miscavige and security guards. And there were two or three people I remember that had the balls that they would just go in there when they wanted to. As long as you weren't mm -hmm. caught in there by Dave, then there was no way of knowing. Yeah, but you yeah. knew that if you got if you went in there, it would come up in, in your counseling and you'd get in trouble. But Spike Bush would go in there. No, I know. Jesse well, Radstrom would go in there. I knew people that went in there. Well, Abby Jesse Ambron. Radstrom was an RTC staff member. But, no, no. Um, this is when he was in grounds. Oh, oh. I wow. promise you. I oh. promise you. No, it, it's kind of it's kind of wild in that way. But I wanted to I wanted to get into the uh I've and I've been wanting to say this for a while because I've watched quite a few of your interviews, I think most of them. And I know you sometimes talk about and sometimes reflect back on, on the position you had and uh, the effect you had on people. And, and I think by nature, your position can be harsh or, or vindictive. It could be or, or abused. Yeah, it was a position abused. that could be simply very much abused. Yes. But I want to point something out. And, and this is a question that I bring up in every one of my lives. Does Scientology make people bad or are they just bad and it's amplified by Scientology? And you are a perfect case study for me, Jackson, in that because you are in a position where you could have been horrible. You could have been the worst person, but you're going to find most people that have left and even people that were there would not have a whole lot of bad things to say about you, even though you were in a position where you, you could have be books written tyrant. about it, right? Well, and, and I know, and I, and I don't want to embarrass you or make it, but, no, but this not, is my point from someone that knew you and knew you pretty well. Um, and there are some security guards of that property that are just uh, horrific human beings. Danny Dunnigan being one of them, or Danny done it again. Um, I just want to say from my point of view, you built camaraderie with, with, your, with your Saturday morning drilling. drilling mm -hmm. that to this day, like I say, I still use. Uh, you were kind. You were polite. You may have had to make some decisions or do some things that were damaging, but you were following L. Ron Hubbard policy, which is damaging. Right, right. But the way you approached it, you at least had a heart about it, and you tried to do what you thought was best, which is why you didn't last as long. Let's be honest. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I look back and I wonder if – I mean, my loyalty was there, I'll tell you that. Um, if, if one thing didn't happen, this kind of gets talked about amongst our little crowd, that if one thing didn't happen, do you think you'd still be there? Yeah, but I think that would have led up to the next thing happening that I wouldn't have been there. I only wish that I was there to, uh, with the level of knowledge that I now have to start to have figured out how to capture information and then walk away with because uh, uh, what information th 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 that we can't present is hardcore hands-on evidence. Mm -hmm. um, the only evidence that we have to now present our listening public with is telling the truth. And the stories that you hear are self-collaborating. None of us sit here and figure out, including you and I as an example. We we never go, we're going to talk about this and do you remember and correct each other. The, the information just freely flows out and it's the truth. And yeah. uh, all we can do is tell you the truth. I wish I had the pictures that I once had to show you of some of the events, some of the people, some of the places and uh, it's odd that we can't do it. Well, that odd is answered by the simple fact that that was something that I had long ago established of clearing from people's personal belongings before they actually left. And that was going through them and pulling them from that and then eventually destroying them. But claiming any and all pictures representing the staff or the it base, its geographic location was deemed property of Church of Scientology International. So therefore... I was authorized to take possession of it and no longer allow the individual to have possession of it. And if you want to leave, we have to take these pictures. If you made a fight and a stand on your own to continue possession of those, you couldn't leave. Right. And even if you were in the final stage of that day, this is the day you're officially leaving You had a plane ticket bought and I'm checking, going through your personal belongings, pulling such stuff out of it. And you made a big issue about it. All it would do is end up delaying because I I can't let you leave with with that stuff. So people naturally just resolved to 
handing it over and um, right. saying goodbye for it, saying goodbye to it. Did you and, see that? Uh, yeah, even Mark, my gold. Yeah, that's probably Janice <laughs> and Mark. Um, you know, and uh, it was sad while I was staying there doing it. I mean, I even the. I mean, I could just. Talking about these topics, Sterling, is I, I I find myself easily walking back in a mental state of mind of what it was like going through people's personal belongings, every pocket of every clothing item inside the shoes, every page of every book, anything and everywhere that we had learned people stuffed things into. And, um, you know, over the course of time, uh, even you probably saw that story with Mark talking about how uh, you and I know those two people that they set up to the distraction that went into the property and they got stuff in through the mail lines. Um, communication link into the mail lines that, uh, you know, we didn't know everything to do and how to, how to, what to watch out for is, but eventually, uh, you know, we learned over the course of, of discovery of how to improve our security procedures. And I look back at that and I, myself, you know, this, this yearbook I refer to, I purposely kept that because it was a Scientology book and they would see that it's actually my best interest that I take that with me. I took it because it represented my people, the, my friends. And it was a pictorial, like I call it now, um, the it base yearbook. And cause that's what it is to me. Um, they took away my high school elementary and I didn't go to high school and what took away my elementary yearbooks. I don't have any of that of my life to sit here and giggle and laugh with and relive and show, um, and be entertained myself of my, of my own past. So right. luckily we worked at the audiovisual headquarters of Scientology and, um, uh, you know, we know the behind the scenes shit. And when I realized the gold mine that I had, I was like, I want to take this with me. Like, I'm going to be a good little Scientologist. I took right. that fucking book. So I had a yearbook with me. And, and Jackson, um, I'm glad you did. I'm going to ask you to just, because I've been <laughs> looking for that picture in that book forever. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you, uh, obviously, after if you can take a picture of that one shot where I'm, I'm falling asleep. Um, <laughs> ironically, that was how I looked all the time while studying Scientology. <laughs> um, but... Uh, but no, I know what you mean. And I guess what I wanted to say after watching a lot of your a lot of your interviews was I, I do see you go down that hole sometimes of, of regret for for the things yeah. that you you may have done based on the policies from L. Ron Hubbard that you were following, but you did them without vindictiveness, without anger, without pettiness. And I think that's what stands you out from other people. I, I really, really do. It, it is, it is, it is, it's a plus in your character that you were even able to do that for as long as you did and still have enough people when your name is mentioned, most people are going to smile when they hear your name. Mm. And I'm not just trying to praise you. I'm telling you what no. my experience is with you. Uh, and that was, and there's plenty of people there I did not have that experience with. And again, like Mike Brown, you were another person that was in my life and then just disappeared. Yeah, I didn't know you guys. You don't ask when someone disappears where they went. That just doesn't happen. You disappeared, and definitely man, when noticed I, when I saw you in California and playing softball, and and I knew we could go to baseball games. I was thrilled. I was like, "That's amazing." So, all I wanted to say to you was, in, in my experience, I know there's some of those things. We've all done some of those things uh, we regret, or where we could have stood right. up, or we right. where the, if we had a time machine. I know a lot of us have had that 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 dream or that wish that we could go back to a particular incident while we were there and know what we know right now and say something different. We really do. Um, you know, if, when Dave Miscavige was up just blowing everyone away at a, at a, a base briefing, I would have loved to have raised my hand, stood up and told him just to shut up. <laughs> go fuck yourself. I would have loved that moment of silence in between paragraphs. Yes. Yes. Where you could hear literally a needle drop on the hit the floor and, and you just go, go fuck yourself, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, imagine that Sterling, how, how it we're leaving. Uh, yeah. There would also be the, the morbid, what's going to happen now. We, you know, this is like yeah. an impending yeah. serious car accident about to happen. Yeah. So people are like, they want to see it happen. Yeah. And there goes that person's soul right then and there. You know, as com yeah. comedic as we can make it, it was also a hundred times more tragic. The results were always cool. going to be a hundred more times more right. tragic. But 
you know, that's just a pie in the sky dream. You know, I've talked to people about that. It, yeah. It's got to happen at these, one of these events being recorded live that Dave cannot undo. And, uh, you know, those days are kind of gone because he's learned to record it and then edit it to his liking and then send it out. Well, and but, you have to have a pass and a ticket to get into events now. So that's yeah. never happening. I mean, well, everyone, no, it could, yeah. it could happen anytime as long as the right person is in the right place at the right time. Right. But right. it's never going to see uh, outside ears because Dave no longer allows live, live events because he knows right. how stupid that is. Uh, minimally, he can't trust everybody it all the time because a live event would mean him getting served on stage and that being transmitted around the world as it's happening would shut Scientology down just like that. So to think that he doesn't have those thoughts and that's a good, one of the major reasons why there's no longer live events transmitted around to every org like there used to be. Now it's all into, it's going to happen and then we're going to get the DVD and we're going to have a showing event to uh, basically the edited version of said event to Dave's liking. And yeah. those, believe me, <laughs> and you and I both know, Sterling, what hits uh, a, a seer member's ears, eyes, or a public paying uh, person uh, looking in search of Scientology services, what yeah. hits their ears all goes through Dave. Absolutely. And uh, uh, yeah, there's nothing out there that's presented that is a money-making effort, ultimately, that is not authorized by Dave. So it's just the controlling the source of information, and it's all done by Dave. I, I don't know what we can do to ever fully believe the fact, uh, help people believe and understand that, yeah, there is one human being that can be in charge of so much. Mm-hmm. Well, when you create a fear factory like he has, an extremely fear uh, fearful crew and, and loyalists, people who are loyal to you, they will not do anything without you authorizing it. So that's kind of the way in which he controls the ability to control the information presented to the world. Yeah. about Scientology, about him. Yeah, he's, about the, head of, he's the head of the snake, but we do have to agree, Jackson, that that it, it he has to have lieutenants that yeah. are oh, yes yeah. men, yes men and yes women yeah, that are absolutely. willing to perform and execute horrendous acts in order to enable him to continue yeah. to do that. That's because right. really, really four or five people, had they stood up and said, no, Dave, I'm not doing that. Yeah. Uh, he he maybe could have gotten rid of them and, and wiped them out, but then but then more and more people would have been like, well, those guys stood up; they've been here forever. I mean, there's a lot of scenarios that could have played out differently mm-hmm. had people in, in top position had the balls to stand up and say something. Right. Um, right. But you know, th- again, that that that's wishing. But before we get into questions, because again, there's some great questions and and some really nice comments. I I want to just relay real quickly, Jackson, what I mean by when I say the things that you taught me while I was there, I use to this day. Um, okay. And I think, I think it's such an important thing when you, when, when you can in a medical situation remain calm and I, I, I'll remember like it was yesterday. And you know how we, we remember certain things and it doesn't necessarily make sense, but for whatever reason, all the drilling I do with you, I remember uh, from propping the back of the neck up so the tongue doesn't go down the throat to uh, making sure the victim stays completely still if there's a potential spine or neck injury to making sure they're comfortable. If it's if it's a hot sun, putting a blanket over all these different things that you taught us, I, I still remember to this day. And even, even when I do preps for Santa Ana season and, and I, I get some fire hoses and some pumps out, um, I, I will... If someone's around, I will go, come here, I'll show you how to roll up a fire hose. And I'm not even joking. <laughs> this is this is 20 years later. I'll be like, here, you hold this end. The female, the, the male end's got to be on the inside and you got to hold it while I roll up the hose. All these things. I, and I, it actually still brings joy when I do them. But um, I'll give you a specific instance that, that just makes it. I was at a, um, when I was working in Saudi, I was at a football tournament, uh, a kid's football tournament. And um, this kid got injured. And uh, I, their mom was there and they came up and I saw them, you know, walk off the field and they went to they went to the I guess the school nurse or whatever they had at that particular school it was the British school in Saudi. And um, they came back and the mom uh, walked up to me and she's like, Sterling, I'm, I'm concerned. My, my, my daughter, the, the, the nurse just said, you know, I sit a little bit and go home and you'll be OK. And um, I remember her walking out and going, would you mind looking at him? I'm like, sure, no problem. So you know, it was her wrist. She had fallen hard on some turf that had concrete underneath and i remember looking at her wrist and then just touching it you know doing you know doing the assessment that you you taught us to do um and i was noticing there's there's quite a big bump that wasn't that wasn't a bruise 
uh, right where her wrist met her hand. And I'm going back and forth on it. I'm like, does that hurt? Does it still hurt? And she goes, yeah. And I go, you know what? I'm not a doctor, but I can almost guarantee you that is a dislocation. Um, and, and the nurse told you not to go to the doctor. She goes, no, she said, it'll be fine. The swelling will go on. I said, I, I say, go to the doctor. I say, go to the doctor. Cause that doesn't look like it's anything mm. other than that. And, and I did it very calmly and I was able to just, you know, just not get excited about it and do it. She goes to the doctor. I get a call two hours later from the mom profusely thanking me because mm. it was a dislocated. It needed to be reset. And, wow. uh, you know, Hey, it, the, the, you know, she recovered pretty quickly from it and she was just super happy that someone was able to tell her something that was correct. And, um, I mean, at that moment, I remember going, wow, the only reason, the only reason I was even able to comment on it was because the training that wow. I did with you and that I always, always uh, be thankful for. So uh, thank you. How about well, that? you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. I, you know, uh, you know, I, you say all this and I remember the days in which I was teaching the staff about the bone structure of the human body and, uh, you know, basically the, the, the sim simple aspects to understand a human body in the event that you walk around a corner, find a staff member laying on the ground. What do you do? Um, and, uh, you know, basic bone structure and finding something angulated or whatever. What, I just remember going to that thought process of how do I deliver this to everybody? So it's simply understood, but yet there's not a lot of significance behind it because all that was all stuff that I was trained on at the fire department. Right. And I was certified in, and I, I not only was trained in it, but I also saw it uh, a thousand times right. and dealt right. with it myself. So I felt as a Sea Org member, anyways, I had a lot of fun with that, Sterling, of figuring out how to teach eight, 900 people standing in front of me to twin up where Joe and Sam work together or Stacy and, and Bob twin up, you know, break the staff down so they can learn it with each other and teach it on each other, right. take what I'm providing them and put the information to work. So they walk away with information that they can use in their back pocket. That was my goal was to give you and everybody else the ability with solutions to life's problems that you would suddenly find yourself or could suddenly find yourself no matter where you are confronted with and how, what do I do? So, and that was the basic, that was my mantra to myself is, what can I fulfill an answer to a staff member going, what do I do? Right. And I was a little offended when the drills came out. Um, later on, the Scientology, the new drills, uh, the new golden age of tech, because that was the line that was used in the drills. If a PC's needle looks dirty, what do you do? That became the backbone of the gold, right. golden age. And I really wonder, I, I, I have to ask Dan Koo that one day if... <laughs> Is if, uh, if that was related to what, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it, it would make sense to me and I'm not trying to, whatever yeah. it just, uh, it just was like, really, are you kidding me? Are you using my same line that I would use to drill people? And now here you're drilling otters how to be otters. What do you do? You motherfucker. <laughs> was, was fine. And anyways, it was just more of a comic understanding of the big picture, but I absolutely love doing those drills. So many people tried to give their input and tell me how to do it, which I right. refused. And I, I would just tell it to the face. You have no idea what you're talking about. I do. And um, this ain't a pissing contest. I have working information. You don't. So it ain't going to happen. Right. Right. Because I could have been thrown astray on that whole thing and allowed somebody to be my guide. Institute. Nobody. I mean, the, the cool thing was is nobody truly knew what to do. So right. I was the only one with the information, information's power. And the staff found the beautiful power in this simple information that whether you were in the Sea Org or not in the Sea Org or in wherever, it was something you could take with you forever in your life. And it's just, it fascinates the shit out of me, Sterling, this years later, something I said and taught you is still at play. Right. And, um, right. you know, that just fascinates me. I'm not... Uh, and I wasn't the creator of such information. I was just the vehicle. I was the provider of it and the exposure to it and help, uh, and help you understand it. And when I, it was my, my goal, my job to educate you. And that tells me that what I did, you just being one example. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful to think there's many others, um, that, um, uh, to this day still kind of draw for, I remember, you remember Londa Mitchell? 
Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yeah, she ended up all the way in Australia, and, and she had some fires on her thing, and she reached out to me and told me the shit that I taught her, she was out there applying. And it no kidding. Of, yeah, it was like, that's, that's awesome. That's halfway around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, okay. yeah, I know. It's, it's just, but see, it's just uh, working information, working knowledge, uh, not changed and given to another and, and helping another understand it. Uh, things that work work and they forever um they forever work it just you, you can't undo something that works so yeah i held purity towards what i was taught because it worked in the fire service and i was like i'm just going to simply teach the staff what i was taught so right in essence you were being trained as a firefighter is my answer to that so if you found yourself following a fire career, you would find a lot of similarities and I would have put you ahead of the class because you already had the knowledge of what you're being taught as a firefighter. Right. So if that makes any sense, anyways. No, it makes total sense. But you know, I was thinking about that too while you were talking, Jackson. In in the insane world that was a, a, the, the week at Golden Air Productions and at the International Base, one of the stable things was your drilling. One of the things that was so clearly sane, easy to assimilate and made complete sense hmm. was your drilling. And I'm wondering if that's why it also has such a big effect. And in a week that could have so many anomalies and stupid events and crazy ideas, your drilling was a staple. It, yeah. was, it was a time where, where all analytical thought and logical reasoning could be, could be expressed because everything you were teaching was very straightforward and logical. And I think people enjoyed that with the, the crazy world that we were living in at the time, right? Well, yeah, you know, I mean, I had to do it times four, four different fields, fire, flood, earthquake, and security. Right. I had to come up with what truth to help give the staff members, what knowledge to give the staff members and how to deal with four life-threatening events. Right. And uh, without introducing confusion, um, but more of a stable piece of information that could be just drawn from randomly that you don't you, you don't see on that day's horizon or agenda that right. suddenly when you're confronted with it you know what to do and um you know i mean i had other training in the fire service i i was a trained instructor so uh, you know i i learned from the best of how to teach another human being something of life-saving value, you know, right. and, uh, I guess I just translated it very well, but I, I gotta tell you, I had a lot of passion. I mean, I, there, there was no haphazardness when I went into that. And, and like I said, I defended a lot of from Wendell Reynolds to other people's input. Right. I just would flat out tell them no. And I wouldn't tell them no as though they're an asshole. It's just like, you don't know. I know. And, uh, it wasn't a pissing contest statement. It was just a matter of factual fact. Right. I know. Right. So I was looked upon as the one and only source of the go-to with that. I remember even talking about talking to um, Martine and, and uh, Jocelyn, who were the in-house untrained medical liaison staff that would care for our medical and health needs. But they themselves were limited on what they knew and even helping teach them a thing or two. Right. So... Anyways, I loved it. It was, uh, I, I, it's a sad thing that I know it doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I can guarantee you some of the good buddies that are back there, if something were to happen, at least it wouldn't happen half as bad as it once did before that training that I did, that Absolutely. they all still retain some knowledge. Whether those fire boxes and the hoses have been maintained in good functioning order, I seriously doubt it. I'm sure there's a lot of those boxes that exist that you open up full of blackwoods. Uh, black widows or whatever yeah, and uh that. the the hoses are in a state of uh unfunctionalness and uh, they're just not functional because of decay uh, right. simply with the o-rings that were in i mean you probably remember the o-rings you had to check make sure there was o-rings yeah. inside the connections Absolutely. you know um Absolutely. so uh you know and then all that medical gear that i had bought all those trauma bags the backboards everything uh everything that i i i I spent a, I put a great deal of work into that. I did have an open-ended bank account to draw from because I told him, if you want this stuff, I'm getting the good shit, not the cheap shit. Yeah. And uh, my sales pitch was every time we use it, I get it replenished through the fire department because I'm a firefighter and I just turned it into a medical aid and I get restocked off the ambulance or at the station. And my captain was completely cool with it, even refilling the, the, uh, 
oxygen bottles when they were used, getting more nasal cannulas or dressings or tapes or whatever. Um, so I had this whole system at play. I guarantee you that stuff really makes me wonder what happened and what the state of all that stuff is. Yeah, um, I'd be interested to know because there was no one else that was good at teaching the drilling. Nor knew the value of caring yeah. for it and keep it, keeping it, inspecting it and making sure it was always functional, you know? Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Well, hey, Jackson, we got some great questions. You want to do some questions real quickly? I don't care where this runs, Sterling. What kind of time restriction are you on or are we uh, on? Well, first of all, if you watch any of my lives, you know that asking me about time is a useless endeavor because okay, I usually good. say I'm going to do 30 minutes and I'm hour and 30. But I think I tagged some really good questions. So let's just hit right. those up. And then as long as you don't have to be anywhere, yeah, no, knock I don't. them out. What time all is right. it, though? We do have uh, games going because I was missing the uh, Tottenham uh, Premier League game. Uh, who are they playing? <laughs> uh, frick. I don't know. I just I like Tottenham. Uh, let's go. Not let's go. Twenty five, and then we're out. How about that? I, I don't care when we go. Don't let my statement put us on a restriction because I really don't like the restriction. So, all right, let's do this quickly then. Uh, bro, 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 Asif, thank you so much for the super chat. I'm a huge Jays fan, and going from Friday thinking he was coming to Toronto only to have yesterday. Yeah, see, I told you that. Remember, you said it was an urban myth. <laughs> So there was, I think it was fake news that was being fed out there. So Brosif, I like that name, by the way. That's pretty cool, Brosif. That's right on. That's man. really cool. And we're so sorry, but we're also happy at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Um, the, the, yeah, the Blue Jays had a chance. But they uh, deep fake culture. Thank oh you for the super gosh. chat. Any news? Any new info on Barrett Oliver? Gosh. I don't know what that's referring to. I mean, I knew Barrett pretty well, but I don't know if it's referring to. Uh, Fuck. Yeah, I don't know. I don't Barrett, know. I don't have any. Jackson, anything? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Barrett, uh, he he got caught up in the church's effort of me losing the love of my life. And he was the one that mentally oh, wow. seduced. That's why. Now I remember. Mentally seduced. Okay. Well, um, yeah, you guys, if you haven't, if you haven't heard that story, you can go to Jackson's channel. He does talk about Well, I don't know if I fully did. I don't know if I've really told it. Oh, I know. I'm remembering. Maybe you didn't, but. Go to. We're not going to obviously cover that whole yeah, subject just, right here. Yeah. That would take a lo little bit longer. But thank yeah, you for it would. Uh, anyways, I do not have any update on Barrett. Um, you know, I would be morbidly curious, but I haven't sought out to figure out. What I do know is that guy never, never hooked up with, with my ex. So um, that was, that was my um, success. That was my goal. That was a threat. That was a bead. I bean I placed in his deep soul and brain to never have happened because he knew that if it did i would come out of the shadows so anyways yeah that's all i have sorry i can't answer that question ma'am no problem no problem Ale uh, elena rainerman thank you for the super chat uh you can tell the core the good heart these two guys have owned from birth kind hearts well thank wow, you so well, thank much thank you elena yeah, I think wow. you're more to Jackson, but thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> you little punk. <laughs> Matt, Matt Elliott, M-A-S-P-T-V Canada. Thank you so much, Matt. Congrats to the Dodgers. Yeah. But you can't buy a World Series. <laughs> well, that's so true, and I agree. It's just you can buy talent for a good, strong lineup, yeah. and uh, that's what was done. Yeah, and it's going to be entertainment, but you're right. You cannot. Yeah. I mean, no. the Dodgers won 100 games last season and couldn't beat the Arizona Diamondbacks. Look at Aaron Rodgers. What? two minutes into this great career for the Eagles and he's out for the rest of the season. Well, that can happen with Otani. So yeah, yeah, yeah. He was for the jets, but yeah, yeah. It's yeah. uh yeah. Brutal, brutal. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. One of the favorite here, uh, Blake Reed. Thank you for the super chat. Sterling, who's your favorite baseball player Gosh, for me? That's a hard question to answer. What? I'm easy. I'm Willie Mays. Uh, oh, well, my, you know, my first go-to favorite, Steve Garvey. Oh, that's okay. the original that's infield good. lineup. Ron say, Bill Russell, Davey Lopes, Steve Garvey, and Jaeger behind the plate. Jaeger, that nice. was the best best infield of the historic Dodgers. Yes. Okay, John B. Thank you so much for the super chat and the five dollars. I'm not saying those words out loud. That's like saying Voldemort <laughs> out loud. Uh, but thank you so much for the chat. Yeah. I appreciate it. Appreciate um, your passion for your team, there, John but, B. But yeah, good try though. Good try. Yeah. Good yeah, try. Yeah. <laughs> Sucks to be you, but uh, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, Metalhead, thank you so much for the super chat. When people escape in base, did guards walk by their side and talk to them, or were they putting hands on the escapees? Uh, I would say 80% walking, 20% hands-on. 
Fantastic. Well, I, I knew I knew my limits. Uh, uh, just as a human being, I could not physically force somebody to do something. But at times, for my own survivability, somebody was eight seed. Eight seed. Which is the uh, Scientology term no, that's for <laughs> training. Yeah. Uh, Blake Reed, again, this guy is a regular Jackson. He's awesome. He has great questions. I love that Sterling can't stop laughing at his intro. <laughs> it's true. I cannot. It is. It's funny every time. Um, sorry. I just, it's, it, I'm surprised you know. the church hasn't gone to whoever created that, the, the, the right? joking and degrading aspect and sued them into oblivion to threaten them. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. so good. It's so good. Um, John Shostowski, how about Jackson on game night? Well, how about Jackson on game night? I, have a I would love about- it. I sit there and go, God, I would be so, I, I, I feel I could be productive. I, you know, I know there's a lot of people wishing they could be part of it. So I don't want to get in the way of anybody else, but no, you know what? I would love it. We're developing it. We'd love to have you. I just think, I just think it would be a, another Mike Brown scenario where you're going to lose the bad people game because people <laughs> they're not going to vote for you. For yeah, the well, I would just love having fun because I had a lot of uh, contributive answers. Uh, but okay, you know, well, I so I tried to get a hold of uh, of Double A Ron and um, freaking Tool Bucket won't call me back. I don't know what I've done. I don't know if I've pissed in his cornflake somehow, but he won't call this? me back. Aaron, a double A wrong. Oh, call him again. He's busy. Uh, he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't get the phone from me all the he time. He sees either. my name on his phone coming up, the <laughs> dude. Well, we're going to do a mini game night right this second. Okay. So, <laughs> so everyone, get, get, get your fingers ready. Uh, you're going to vote on Jackson or I for this question. Oh, and I pulled it randomly. Don't so, pull up that CWC statement. Here we go. <laughs> if we were all hitchhikers, who would be the last person to get picked up? Go ahead, guys. Let's see what you got to say about that. Uh, Come on. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I guess starts. a mini game night. Mini game night tool bucket. No, that's not. Okay, who'd <laughs> be the last person said. you picked up? Jack Sterling. Okay, thank you so much. Japan of Green Gables. Sterling, happy puffin. Can I block these people? Jackson. Okay, here we go. <laughs> David, David Miscavige. <laughs> Jackson needs to adopt Reese. I agree. <laughs> Sterling. Okay, guys, I'm winning this one, Sterling. Okay. I, I love how Aaron was able to keep a live tracking of percentages. Yeah, he can do that on his channel. He does a yeah, live poll, which that, is amazing. Yeah, that was a cool way of adding to that. So what was the uh, the question again, Sterling? It was, if we were all hitchhikers, Jackson and I, yeah. who would be the last person to get picked up? Oh, okay. I want to say we're tied So they right get now. me first is what they're... Okay, so we're tied. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I can't count exactly, but it, it, it's pretty close. It's pretty close. That's funny to see John S. <laughs> 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 Mr. Stotowski. I mean, I, I love that guy. He I got to tell you. He, he is, is such... He is a behind the scenes. I don't even know if he's been in or not, but <laughs> there it is. Sh- Shostowski. Shitowski. Yeah, Don and, Paris, though, uh, no way Sterling is hot. Definitely he's just over. A cool, <laughs> what's that? No way Sterling is hot. Definitely. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no. It's a question, uh, John, like, what I get in the car. Looks then. like someone wants some whipped cream with that hot chocolate there, Sterling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. So we're just going to go with Jackson and I tied on that one. Yes, I would love to have Jackson on sometime. Let's do that. Let's do that. Uh, in our answer, Sterling, one comes with the other. So, uh, <laughs> And just so you know, it, it, there's not a selection process. There's not. It's just It's just a lo- purely logistics I thing. I know. I know, yeah, yeah, so it's you know I, I guess Mike was last week and and um, the, you know Aaron had reached out to him so yeah we we would love to do it we'd love to do it yeah. um, it's so much fun okay yeah. um, next question no way Sterling is hot definitely pull over <laughs> oh my God Mark Barker Mark Barker that's a great name hi all listen to the live as long as I can sitting in car waiting for daughter to come out of Target LOL. RJ. All right. Well, yeah. first of all, I always love to hear where people are listening. I know. And two, Mark, you're probably going to get, if your daughter's in Target, you're screwed. You're probably going to be able to listen to this entire thing um, waiting for her to come out of Target. Because as we know, once you get in there, you can't get out. Uh, but thank you so much. <laughs> Casey, matching Dodgers hats today. Oh, yeah. Isn't that the cool? Dodgers. Um, I think we got these at the same time, too, Sterling. If right? I, I think know, we did. I, I, and here we go. The SP Chef. Hello, all watching Switzerland. Switzerland. International crew, Jackson. One of the things I love about this. Yeah. Um, Wonder Woman. Oh my so gosh. many have shared such positive Jackson stories. Seems like a great guy to know. And uh, yeah, I can vouch for that. I can vouch for that. Um, well, definitely. I think I could do about myself. But yeah. 
<laughs> uh, Bo Bergquist, Bergquist, Jackson, listen to your touching story with Aaron. Always had a soft spot for you in my heart, and you always seemed too good for the CSO, too good for the Church of Scientology. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I want to imagine, Jackson, you, you. you would have been a fire chief and and gone down in the, the fire chief's hall of fame had you never been in the church. But you know, that's my, that's my, opinion. you know, it's funny you say that Sterling. I back in August was able to, uh, have a face to face with one of my original captains. I got to see him move up from firefighter to the high ranking chief that he is today in, in California's fire department, Cal fire. And he is just a soul brother to me. And I found out from him that I am equally, if not more of a soul brother to him, which was trippy wild to hear but um uh yeah i mean he told me himself he knows exactly where i would be in that system if the church hadn't done what they done that i would minimally um yeah i would at least have a firehouse and a crew below me anyways yeah okay cool good deal good yeah. deal all right let's see and moving along um okay here we go um Amanda Deer, 0812. Jackson, did you spend most of your time in Scientology as security? Did you ever do a technical post? Yeah, unlike popular demand as a Sea Org member, um, and like marriages in the Sea Org, you tended to have a, a large resume. Um, I didn't. I had two posts, and I was in security the entire time. Um, from 1982 to 1996. Okay. Oh, okay. from 79 to 86. I mean, I, uh, granted, I was in the cadet org and SEMO pack, but it was, those jobs were short-lived. But yes, I was in security. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. A long, long time. Sharon Paris. Sterling, I'm so aggravated that YouTube keeps unsubscribing me that's from That's a shame. You. Well, this is a perfect opportunity to ask everyone that's watching live, 474 of you and everyone in the chat, to please go like and subscribe to both my channel and Jackson's channel. And Jackson's channel, in case anyone doesn't already know, is at Gary Jackson Moorhead. So can, please can like you see my guys. my page and see how many? I you know I'm like in awe that ten people will be watching. You said what four what four seven four seven four four seven one? It so goes much. up and down. I I got to. Uh, well, you keep doing what you're doing. I'm logging into mine. You got it. You got it. All right. Um, Amanda, uh, <laughs> Amanda, <laughs> Amanda Deer, 0812. Jackson is so sweet. I can't imagine him being security. It's just so opposite his personality. Yeah, right. I agree. And, you know, he wasn't that type of security guard either. He was actually the one that you would want to confide in more than anything else. Uh, Jessica Beach. Let me get rid of that one. one oh, okay. Second. So it is live on my channel. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely yeah. live. Um, Jessica Beach. Here we go. Uh, how did you guys feed your baseball addiction while you were in? Did you get to watch games on TV? Go ahead, Jackson. Uh, I'm sorry. I was distracted by somebody pointing to this graphic of this guy. <laughs> uh, me standing in front of a fire engine with my crew at the time. Uh, I don't know where that, how that came to be. Someone, someone did that. Interesting. Um, Jessica Beach. Sorry. Uh, how did you guys feed your baseball addiction while you were in? You know, um, how do you answer that? Uh, I had a I had a handheld police scanner that was basically open ended. It was not restricted. I could any is there as long as there was a frequency transmitting something, I could enter it into my scanner and listen in. So I listened to TV stuff like that, and um, you know, I I had access to. I mean, this is for me. Uh, I had access to my security truck that when I would drive uh, either to Los Angeles or I would drive. You found your little ways. Uh, you knew and identified and programmed into the radios, the, the channels. Uh, some areas would be playing sports events such as motor pool or the sets and props area. They would have radios set up in the places and during events there was transmitted games. You know, um, Vin Scully would be announcing the game and, and you would hear it out in the Los Angeles area. So that's, we didn't that's have a new did. newspaper. I had access to the local newspaper, so I. Well, would we used out to get the... USA Today's, if you remember. Yeah. In the well, that was during the, during the, um, what is that? Uh, that the that Time Magazine yeah. fiasco. The Time Magazine yeah, fiasco, yeah. but the uh, Eli Lilly ads, the counter Eli Lilly ads that were being run. Right. 
we had a stacks and on every dinner table, every every sitting table and where we ate, Dave had uh, a USA Today. So we had that for a few months. That was that actually was so cool because I took from that the graphics that they would do on weather and where they would teach you what what certain weather indications or cloud formations and and how certain weather events came about. That was part of the animated version of the USA Today right. uh, weather page. And I used to take from that and forward it and carry it over to my staff to help them understand weather. And I used to run around MCI looking if anyone had old newspapers, pull out the sports section because uh, there was quite a few people that did not care about the sports section. And I would sometimes, I remember in 1993, I had a portable radio. And while I was cleaning the pool up at L. Ron Hubbard's house, I was listening to the 1993 World Series between the Phillies and the Toronto Blue Jays. And then another time while I was there, I did have a beeper that had give you a Motorola beeper that gave you updates on scores. So during course, I would sneak into the bathroom and then check an update on the scores during the playoffs or the World Series. Yeah, so <laughs> to each our own on that. Uh, and then we when I was figured on figured out our ways, yeah, yeah. When I was on watch at the at the <clears throat> at the housing properties off the property, um, I, I could I could sneak by a radio and I would listen as I walked around the properties with my baseball bat. In my back hand. in our back in August, I went by Kirby. Yeah. Yeah, strange seeing that facility. Still there. Okay. Um, good question from Amanda Deer again. Amanda Deer 80812 Jackson, was your job more keeping people in or keeping people out? Which one had more emphasis? More emphasis was keeping people in. And uh, that transitioned over the course of time. Um, mostly because more and more people started expressing interest in leaving or became uh, a quote unquote identified as a security threat. And I had more traffic on my lines, traffic meaning um, an increase of perceived security threats, whether it was a staff member or outside. But yeah, we never had many people coming over the fence. I had created such a safe environment that even the local sheriff's department came out and uh, the watch commander actually said in his jurisdiction, this is the safest section of his jurisdiction wow. statistically. And uh, he wanted to see how and why we were able to achieve that. And he kind of would show off the shit that we had in the booth and um, how good the guards were. I mean, I made an effort aside from Danny done it again <laughs> to have a bunch of good guards <laughs> below me, you know? Oh. Um, I don't think there's words Jackson that could describe Danny Dunnigan uh, no. appropriately. That guy is just a unique, evil, bad human being. Yeah, I mean, just, you're, you were not going to find a single person that has a single good thing to say about I, I, that guy. Yeah, and I couldn't, yeah, anyways. Okay. I tried All right, to next one. I could have been. <clears throat> Here we go. Wonder Woman. Sterling got busted on purpose so he could have access to the ball court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of true. When I was in grounds, I was a, I was able to get out all, all those. And we actually did, Fuck. Jackson, after you left, I don't know if you know this, but we did start a softball team uh, and, and played in a local league and also used to play the Native American tribe. Well, down, I was part of road. that. Yeah. Uh, when yeah. Hoden, when that was a whole PR thing. Yep. I uh, mean, those guys used to kick our asses. No, they, they we would beat play. them. We beat them one time. Well, what, fast pitch or slow fast pitch? Fast pitch, fast pitch. Yeah, yeah, see, we couldn't stand up against that. Holy shit, those guys. No, were I, I put together a pretty good team somehow, uh, and I don't know how, but we and did. What year was that? One. What? What year? Uh, that had to be 1998 or 99 is my guess. Well, I was part of that. I mean, I may have not been to every game, but I was, you know, <laughs> was Hoden was Hoden the skipper? Uh, Hoden was not the skipper. Oh. No, he was just the organizer. I wouldn't Abby? let Hoden near a baseball field. Um, was it Abby or Weesey or who was it? I had Abby on the team. I had Weesey on the team. I had Russ Grelick on the team. Yeah, Carrie Clark was on the team. Okay. Um, yeah, that had to be a, I could, maybe it was during the time I went to the Incom mission because it must have been, yeah, you weren't there yeah. because I would have remembered you. Yeah, and I would have definitely been part of it. Yeah, they would have intentionally walked you every time. All right. Um, <laughs> Here we go. Human question. Sterling and Jackson, what are your favorite baseball and or basketball positions to play? I was catcher. Um, I love catching. Um, and then in the softball, I was, uh, I had the wicked ability to strike people out at unlimited arc, slow pitch softball. So I, I, and uh, yeah, just that became my thing. So I was a pitcher on the team. Okay. I, center fielder for me, guys. Outfield, mm -hmm. center field. 
uh, you know, don't put me in the infield. I'm, I'm, I'm a danger. I'm a hazard. Uh, I got the yips when it comes to ground balls, but, uh, yeah. Yips. Yeah. That's a good uh, one. Outfield Sterling all day long. Yips, that balls, Tompkins. Yeah. That ball's in the air, man. I will catch it for sure. Yeah. And, and, and then I've got a decent hose. So I will, I will throw people out from time to time as well. Yeah. Um, I try the infield, uh, just to humble myself from time to time. And it really, really works. Okay. Um, <laughs> Clearwater Claire the Taylor, great name. Comment, taking away the fun parts or that which gives you happy endorphins is a prime action of cult leaders. Yep. I see DM is more of a voracious cult leader than LRH. Yeah. That's where I made that comment about the grounds. I had seen that, um, mm. Jackson. I think that's absolutely appropriate and true when it comes to that property. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, Something very of which I wish we were only aware of back in the day because uh, I know. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's Clear a great comment. Clear the Taylor. This one's also good. Leah, uh, oh man, Jackson was in a position where he could have been the villain. He's a he ha he's got a good heart though, and he may have been his downfall. I would actually argue, yeah. Um, you know, what do you say about that, Jackson? Uh, whether it was my downfall, my downfall was uh, I don't know a, a downfall. My only downfall was the needle not reacting the way the church was asking it to react. So um, no matter how much I stood up for myself, I couldn't overcome that. Right. They right. would believe the meter more than what came out of my mouth. The honesty came out of my mouth. And that was part of the, yeah, I guess that would be my downfall was not being, I mean, you, you Sterling, I mean, we, we all learned what it, what it took for us to stand up for ourselves and fight for ourselves. And that became the ultimate fight that you never imagined that you would ever be fighting for yourself. So thank you, Leah. I mean, yeah, I'm, you question. know, I, 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 I know that that's not the true Leah that, that I know, but, um, that's a Leah that understands the things that we, we talk about, which is simply the truth. So, um, her question is derived from us and myself and you telling the truth. So yep. she gets it. She did. Great question, Leah. Yeah. All right. Wonder Woman, Sterling, thank you for having Jackson's back. Uh, you're welcome. It doesn't take much to have Jackson's back. That's <laughs> just a natural reaction to someone with a big heart. So, you know, there we go. <laughs> um, Wonder Woman, question. What happened to people's valuables that were confiscated? I think Mark and Janice want to know this. <laughs> well, um, I know uh, uh, some of it was pulled in uh, the, whatever was of interest to RTC was taken up to RTC, the loose shoes and random socks and, you know, jewelry and whatever that was obviously of not direct value to RTC was, uh, either sat in storage until it decayed and someone needed the space came along, cleaned it out and threw it out. Some of it was just thrown out. It was kind of more of a one-on-one -on -one basis, but, um, everything that was pulled from it was fed up to RTC. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. All right, uh, another great question here. Elena Rainerman, question. I know you were good souls. When you had to do something that was difficult to follow, did you immediately realize it was bad, but did it for the good of the idea of saving the planet? Absolutely, because you had to represent compliance to what you were being directed to do. I would inject my own, I can't do it that way, I'm going to do it this way, achieving the goals, but of lesser impact on the individual, if that makes sense. It does. And that's a great um, answer. You know, it. it's okay that they have water. Well, I would make sure it was had ice in it, you know, even little things like that. I, I would not, you know, if I was told that I had to feed them the food off the floor, I would at least pick the obvious dirt out and cockroaches from it and right. put some flavoring in it. Um, so yeah, that's trying to make the best of a very shitty situation. That was kind yeah. of, that's your character. I, yeah. And I, I would, yeah. Yeah. I just, I just, I couldn't bring it to myself to do that. Atkins in Texas, one of my favorite people on here. Question, what brings you joy now, Jackson? And also, how do you process through your difficult memories now? Therapy, meditation, time in nature. You know, um, that, that interview that Aaron did with Natalie Webster the other day, she, um, she, she, if there's an answer to be able to give on this, I have never, I tried to go to a therapist once. I couldn't get over and past the three times that I went and I was very open with therapists about, uh, 
I know this is all based off of money. I have a hard time seeing through that. You're not genuinely here for me. So you're not genuinely listening to what I have to say and what we're going to talk about. Um, I, 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 you know, whether that had a negative impact on the, the lady or not, it just, I couldn't get over beyond that. So I'd probably end up spending a lot of money just to be able to arrive at the fact that, yeah, I can comfortably be here and have uh, a productive therapeutic moment. Um, how do I process through it? I didn't process through much through it. Um, God, I just saw someone in Sid White say, my grandson is a proud member of the Cal Fire Brotherhood. Yay. Um, uh, Stay I just, yeah, I know. Um, I, I, uh, time is what is dealt with where, where I really got the greatest gain is when I finally spoke out publicly and it was, uh, Sterling, you would understand this, my proverbial yeah. filing of a official knowledge report in which you put, you, you deliver factual information, knowing something you'd actually get done about it. Well, telling the truth in this public forum does result in changes on the inside. Um, which is good. It's, 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 uh, unavoidable by OSA staff that are listening because the more that it is exposed and, and told by those that walk the walk and talk the talk, um, we are witness to these wrongdoings and bad arrangements inside the walls of Scientology. And they are by that nature forced because over time, uh, the ears that need to hear it do hear it. And they put the church to the test, whether it's a media outlet or, uh, even an in, in-house attorney going, we need to stop doing this. We need to come up with a different way. We can no longer force abortions or do whatever. Right. Um, and, and it does change. So, um, what brings me joy now, <clears throat> you know, the constant realization of my own freedom, um, making some incredibly good, dear, loving friends outside of Scientology that I have found that they find out about Scientology before I've even expressed to them and let them know that I was in it. I've even got coworkers now that call me up and goes, Hey, this is Tom Cruise. Um, you know, and just happily joke around with me on it because they, they understand the craziness that I was part of. And that's that in itself is relieving because you as an individual, uh, it took me a while to shake hands with my own reality of believing that, I bought myself into a cult. I was brainwashed. You know, that's a, that's a bold statement and bold thing to recognize for yourself as an individual, as far as I'm concerned, because it's freaking truly embarrassing. It doesn't match my character that I know myself as a character to be. So all I do is try to improve my character and my, who I am. I, I like to walk around believing I am that one person. If you see me driving by and you're broke down the side of the road, just wave for help and I will be that one to stop by give you un, unconditional, unthreatened help, genuine help. You know, I'm just, that's, that's who I like to believe myself to be. There are people on this earth and I represent those, those classes and character type of people. And, um, you know, I have good friends that, uh, that share the same reality and belief, you know, Sterling being one of them, you little punk ass. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, that's Jackson's affectionate way of saying he loves me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I think that's how every phone conversation we start off. I know. <laughs> starts what's off up? with something along what's up, those punk? lines. I think I call you the big goof. Yeah. You call me that. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, uh, Atkins in Texas, I, you know, that, that I could actually go on for a little bit, probably over acknowledge, answer your statement, but um, the processing through my difficult memories now, it's just, it's just something that's ever evolving. There's always new perspectives brought about by other people's expressed views of what they went through. I still can't get over the fact of the shit that started at the Ant base, how far it rolled down the hill and how deep it rolled into the world of Scientology. Because that wasn't always, I mean, there was different ways, but lighter ways it was happening. But in terms of the significance and how screwed up people's lives became, started at the Ant base. Right. I just feel that I witnessed that me and us others, and it's terrible to see how deep it went. And, you know, I've even had discussions with people that uh, were those people at the very end of that long, long path that somehow, you know, I had something to do with that arriving at their doorstep and that life experience for even like Reese, she tells her stories. I'm like, 
that toxicity that she was forced to live as a young child and that, that freedom that that asshole did of flinging and hitting her with that fax machine. Yeah. That freedom of ability to do that without fear of getting in trouble was something that started at the ant base. Yes, it did. And it rolled all the way down to that resulting in, in, in Reese having this terrible forever life changing. I feel partly responsible that, and that's just this constant. I don't, I don't hold myself responsible for it. I just realized that I had something to do with that. Right. And curating that and supporting this wicked asshole. We all know to be David fricking Miscavige. And anyways, that's no, my answer. I get what you're saying. And thank you so much. And, and um, you know, we've talked about that yeah. previously in this particular interview that, that you were doing your job. And yes, any one of us at any time could have said, have we just stood up to David Miscavige at one point and you know, we could have possibly stopped it. And that may even be wishful thinking, but look, it, 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 it's just amazing. Again, it's amazing how Jackson, from your position, you can leave Scientology in the Sea Org. And if you talk to pretty much anyone that was there with you, they're not going to have something bad to say about That's, you. So it, in its it, own sense, it appalls me. That, that the shit That's that a little bit of you doing what you could, because you could yeah. have more easily been a complete prick than been a nice person. It would have been an easier path for you to be mean and nasty, but you chose to be a nice person. So that alone, that alone is something yeah. you did do yeah. to try to change that, yeah. in my opinion. In my opinion. Next question. How about this one? Uh, blackmail MX. Uh, blackmail. Thank you for the $50 Mexican, I guess. Uh, was Jackson a firefighter first and then a Scientologist? Nope. Uh, through the graciousness. Well, in my soul, I was because I will never forget sitting on the corner in Diamond Bar, California, the summer of 70 something, waiting to get picked up before I joined the Sea Org, but waiting to get picked up by my coach to go to baseball practice, having that soul rattling shaking hands with my soul realization of what i wanted to do in life not for anything other than that was my desire and that was to be a firefighter um uh having had that realization at that age i wasn't even aware nor would have would have been capable of pursuing a firefighter path but it wouldn't have stopped me from hanging out at the firehouse like i did but um being thrown in the, the scientology and then accelerated to the upper echelons of the sea organization uh, I didn't even realize that that was not a possibility, but through um, my efforts of helping local people, because we were in a remote area and we were constantly, people were rolling up to the booth, constantly asking for help on somebody who rolled their vehicle down the road and was in an accident. We go down there and we just, by the nature of it, became interactive with the local fire department. And the captain one day said, hey, why don't you become a volunteer firefighter? And I was like, ding, 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 ding. And that was back in 1985. Um, and I told Shelly about it because when we have local fires off in the distance, in Sterling, you're probably familiar with seeing a header off in the distance. Oh, yeah. Um, Shelly would send me and Kenny Siebel off to go help because Shelly had a deep-seated passion to help the local community, and especially under um, emergency conditions. She would give up her staff, me and Kenny, and, told, and yell at us for wondering why we hadn't already left to go out there to help. And, um, I told her about this volunteer program and she, out of her mouth said, you have carte blanche to be a volunteer firefighter at Riverside County Fire. And I was like, this is so bitching. And she said, in <laughs> fact, um, uh, you, um, get, get other staff who are interested. You know, she of course paid concern towards the value of their position. You don't want to pick a church exec, but somebody who could afford stepping away to respond to a local emergency for a couple hours or two and then come back to their job. And the resulting effect was increased PR area control and um, a better image for the property. But nonetheless, I know Shelly was feeding into her desire of in being in her position to build to, this is a solution for her to help the local community. And I gobbled it up. I ate that up so much. Uh, I almost went to the Yellowstone fires when Yellowstone was on fire. I was literally showed up to the firehouse <laughs> uh, 10 minutes too late. The crew already left and I would have uh -oh. been, I would have been gone and pick I would have had, huh? Pick me, pick me. You yeah. Well, yeah. no, it's not pick me. It's just, it's just, I was in a position to have responded. And if I can get in that engine, I would have gone. And, right. um, uh, you know, um, you know, even other incidents, even when the, 
earthquake happened during the World Series. Yeah. Uh, up in San Francisco, I was actually responding to a vegetation fire out in, with my captain sitting in the engine and uh, a fire out in the Indian Reservation. Mm-hmm. And I remember that in the afternoon. And he and both, there was an announcement made on the radio that this earthquake took place and that resources are going to be headed up north. And my captain looked at me and goes, are you ready to go up north? I said, yes, sir. So, anyways, I yeah. w- became deeply involved. Did that answer the question? I probably said way too much, but no, that's all right. Um, that's all right. That's, yeah. that's all right. All right, here we go. Uh, Jay Schwartz, thank you so much for the super chat at the gym, <laughs> listening intently. That's uh, awesome. Love to hear that. Uh, this iron. is another firefighter question from Blake Reed. Thank you for the super chat. Hey Jackson, what was it like being a firefighter? Now, now, Jackson talks about firefighting a lot. So I, I'm assuming that that's been answered, but please go ahead in a succinct 30 second <laughs> statement. I, I, I mean, I have an app on my phone that I listen to scanner feeds and uh, I can listen back to the dispatch back in Riverside County. Um, I'm still tied in with a lot of the brotherhood. I have a, a tremendous amount of people that I grew up with that over time I had found that I first had assumed that they cast me out as the weird one because I was one of those weird ones from out there at golden era to coming to understand that they actually always, they themselves didn't know how to approach and talk to me and help me. But as the world became more aware of Scientology, they were like, dude, I wish I so was there back, back for you. I even had guys, a firefighter call me and apologize for being an asshole to me, not realizing why they were being an asshole to me and why I came across as some dude to be an asshole too. I didn't even realize it at the time, but he was like so apologetic simply because of he saw the aftermath and has come to understand what Golden Air was all about. And it's just an interesting, it's been an interesting past. So um, I absolutely love being a firefighter. I got 20 solid years as a very, very active volunteer firefighter out in Riverside County slash Cal Fire. And, um, you know, uh, the shit that I saw, the stuff I got to do, the fire I got to fight, that's, that's what a firefighter lives for. I'm proud to say I got to shake hands with all of it in all of its diversity in many different ways at many different times and married very different conditions. And, uh, I I'm proud to say I was part of the generation. that still got the right tailboard on a fire engine, which you do not see in today's standards. Um, and that literally is riding on the tailboard of a fire engine responding to calls. Um, you know, uh, pre, Cervical collar days, we used to use rolled up towels wrapped in duct tape for cervical stability. We used to put tape over people's foreheads. And where you transport four people in an ambulance, where now it's every ambulance can only, by legal law and in the HIPAA rules and policies, you can only transport one patient per, per ambulance to maintain. So that's, you know, seeing those resources change, that's a whole lot of money affording for one person in an ambulance. But we used to hang two. And put one on the gurney and put one on the bench seat and have two firefighters back there jumping from person to person doing CPR on the way to the hospital on a bumpy road, you know? I mean, that was the thick of it. That was exciting, but truly shaking hands with truly saving people's lives. And I absolutely loved it. And the friends I had from it, I mean, is this my babbling an answer to your question? No, it's not babbling. What I'm seeing is, is your heartfelt, your heartfelt explanation oh, of something. Absolutely truly- loved it passionate about which yeah. i love which is why i didn't cut you off or stop oh you. Um, well because... i consider it a beautiful art to be able to learn yeah, how to you... be a firefighter and um no and you truly have a passion for it. and i think that yeah. that's one of the most amazing things about you because that's yeah. that's a position that helps other people and i know yeah, I, just, i've known that about you for years it's an it's an incredible yeah. life experience to be able to do that so anyways and you know what i knew we we're i knew jackson we were playing with fire <laughs> and I'm now frozen. <laughs> well, I think you're going to unfreeze because your audio is still clear. It just, no, the audio always stays on. The audio oh. always stays on. Um, people have told me now it may be a Chrome buffering issue or a, a memory issue, but well, I've never had it happen. I, I don't know what it, why it doesn't happen with me. I use the same shit you do, right? Uh, you, who knows? Who knows? I just got to check it out. Maybe there's, please a, don't a let this somewhere. be the reason we come to an end. Cause I want to actually answer people's questions. I don't want, I don't well, like, just so you know, we had no more questions. We had oh. one more thing from pause for andrea oh and i might i might come back in a second here let's see let's see there i am yay <laughs> there we go yeah uh, okay good so you learned that quickly schedule for game night i can't believe it came back yeah hey well maybe we just realized how uh simple it is to resolve it no no it sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't it, okay. it just it just flashed back but um 
You know what, Jackson, thank you so much for being here today. I wanted to, uh, well, I think we should do another interview and I think it should be um, very topical. I would love to like maybe discuss some theories about how different scenarios would have played out had we done something different that time and just have a good time chatting about yeah. what may have occurred. Um, I think you'd be the perfect person to do that with. Uh, sure. And, and I'll, I'll text you or email you about some ideas for that. But before we also go, I would like just to remind everybody that Otani <laughs> is now a Dodger. He's an official um, Los Angeles Dodger. He is now a Dodger, folks. Thank you so much for that. And the $700 million that the Dodgers spent on him. God, I hope it's worth it in the end. Um, reminder, Isn't there a guys, point in which there's so much money, Aaron, I mean, Sterling? I mean, what the frickity frack? Who needs $700 million? I know. Well, you know, I do, Dude. Um, but uh, <laughs> I know it's it's pretty ridiculous considering also that I mean, I'm sure there's some stipulations in his contract, but what if he gets injured at the beginning of next season? I mean, I just know. talk about. Well, like, yeah, they always build that in, but God, I wouldn't ask for seven million. I'd ask for, you know, uh, my favorite flavor of Gatorade or making sure I always, <laughs> Guys, you know, everywhere I go, I would take advantage of that kind of stuff. That's seven hundred million, not including endorsements. Can you imagine oh, the endorsements? Yeah. yeah, the endorsements are just crazy. Because 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 baseball is not an not really an international sport. People say it is, but it's not really international, except for in Japan and Korea. Well, the Toronto but, Blue Jays makes it international. Oh come on, no, no. Well, I'm just saying, just by that. I know. But, um, <laughs> but here's what's crazy: because he is from Japan, it does make it more international. Yeah, and the, the just the endorsements and and the, the guy's going to make now playing in a major market team I know. It is insane the amount of money that's going to be rolling in for him. His agent's probably the one asking for seven hundred. Well, of course. Yeah, and after taxes, et cetera, et cetera, whatever. It's still an unbelievable amount of money. But I'm just happy he's on the Dodgers. I hope I hope it makes yeah. a difference. Um, Jackson, before we we check out, is there anything else you'd like to say? Purple Groovy here threw a question out there. Do you ever laugh at how much taller you were over little Davey and he had to look up to you? You know, secretly, yeah, it was strange standing there looking down at him. And uh, it was, I mean, that's just human nature. I mean, I wasn't, it just, uh, you know, we, we make fun of it now because we can, because Dave is the one human being on this earth that he's completely open season to anything and everything negative. Um, I, where I, I would say and do things that I normally wouldn't to any other human being on the face of earth. Um, but, uh, Dave, Dave's height was, you know, uh, it was kind of overridden by, uh, his demeanor and, uh, just his makeup. I don't know. It just, yeah, it was a distraction. And that's, that's where I came up with this apple box boy, because Sterling, you may remember, when we'd all stand at attention in MCI, when he'd come in, we hear that moment of silence, and all you would hear is these footsteps. Yeah, you couldn't see him down the, the center. You the could not row. see him walking yeah. down, and then you would hear the final clump, clump up there at the podium, and that was him stepping up onto the apple box. Yeah, and uh, so he could be seen over the microphone. <laughs> um, but he had one of those at the Shrine Auditorium, also. But anyways, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, his height thing is. Yeah, it was a it was a, an initial distraction, but it just was something that, um, you know, I mean, he used to walk down to the booth in a robe with flip flops and a cup of coffee, and really? uh, yeah, back in the early days, he said randomly, he would just show up on an early Sunday morning when it was all peacefully quiet, just to come down to see what was up, yeah. like literally, is a guy asking another guy what's going on, <laughs> and he he would come there to enjoy. I don't know. It, I mean, that was a much earlier time that he became a really wicked asshole. But right, right. There were times, and he did that at least a few times. And I was always there on watch when he'd show up for some reason. Anyways, no, I get what you're saying. I know totally, totally. Somebody um, from Argentina. I know we had a lot, guy. Hey, everyone that tuned in this morning, thank you so much. Thank you for the very pleasant, sweet comments, for the great questions. Uh, Jackson and I hopefully can get on again. Yeah. Uh, since the day I started my channel, Jackson was one of the first people on my list. I, I'm sorry that it took so long to do this, um, but we're enjoyable. living life, Sterling. Enjoyable, nevertheless, and I think we will definitely do it again if everyone wants to tune back in. Jackson, thank you so much. I don't know if you've seen my outro. Um, I'm going to pop that up now. It's you know, here's favorite. another funny thing is just as what? a side note, because I'm yeah. going to say this to make an effort to, to get there. Yeah. Is uh, Reese 
constantly expresses how it's how introverting it is, how she feels shy or like some when somebody doesn't call her back. I've called that woman. I can't tell you how many times <laughs> to try to have a live with her just because okay. I think it would be fun to have a sit down and chit chat with her. So next time you see her, tell her, you know, uh, I don't know what it is. It makes me feel bad. I'm like, did I say something to piss her off? Because the amount of times I reached out to her, I get zero responses out of her. And okay, it's okay. anyways, it's just, well, I, I have a feeling that you making this statement publicly and every, and there's a lot of, a lot of Reese's uh, fans yeah. in here. They're probably going to uh, comment when I'm on with her later today, but I'll yeah. also mention and it, it all stemmed from an original, her saying, uh, when she was talking about some way early on in the thing about her having pooped her pants. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I had, a, I, I always leave the message like, Hey, it's a fellow poopy pants storyteller. Oh. I've got a short story to show, you know, cause it was just my icebreaker to have a fun conversation with her. So, I no, mean, yeah, I, it was fire department related, mind you. Okay, um, okay. But uh, anyways, you got it. Tell that I'll woman. Tell that. Yeah, I, I can't <laughs> I'll do anything. It. It's well, you know, Jackson, it's going to come up now no matter what today in the chat. So uh, hopefully well, you'll be watching. What time are you guys having it? Because maybe uh, if you send uh, an invite to me, I'll show up to it. Uh, I think around four o'clock, possibly. Yeah, but I'll have, be available. So yeah, I have to check a couple things, but usually, usually it's funny with Reese and I. I don't tell her anything except for that we're on Sunday, and then I just pop it in on her. Okay. Uh, luckily today, there's no big football games on at four o'clock, yeah. so it'll be a perfect. Is time there any play. weather games? You remember seeing the college games last week? Iowa, I think it was. I don't. Well, I, I work on Saturday, and I don't watch college oh, games. Yeah, neither do I. But I do look for a good weather game, and that oh, yeah, was. Okay. Yeah, you like that the was heavy weather. snowing. Yeah, I love games like that. All right, dude, I'm going to play the outro, and then we will schedule something again soon. Here Maybe we'll see each other around four, which is what? It's four uh, hours from now, five now. hours from now? Yeah, something like that. Here we go. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here?